Welcome. This is George Della with Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, and we are here tonight with our uh, Tuesday Bible study. And um, before we get into that, we want to just take a moment and pray. And uh, you can join us uh, on these uh, Bible studies. They are posted on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Um, once the uh, we we do the uh, Facebook Live, and then the. Uh, I repost the video on my Facebook page and also on YouTube. So if you miss any of it, uh, you can uh, uh, see it again on there. And uh, also, uh, uh, we have our website up, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries. Uh, we have a lot of uh, good materials on there. You can read videos on there, uh, missions information and things like that about the ministry. Also, uh, uh, some books available that I've written over the years. Uh, you can get those also. Let's take a moment before we get into the Word of God tonight, and let's have a word of prayer. And uh, we want uh, all of us to continue uh, to remember uh, all the people being affected uh, throughout the South, uh, between uh, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and now up into Georgia. Uh, those various areas have been affected by this hurricane, especially uh, the devastation we've been seeing in the islands as well. Uh, and, and now all of the flooding that's taking place and then the uh, problems they're having because of the flooding. Uh, there's just a lot of complications that come out of that. And uh, there's going to be a long recovery effort. So we just want to uh, lift those people up. Uh, we, we thank God that uh, uh, the loss of life was minimal. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, this last hurricane wasn't as bad as predicted it did uh, uh, slow down quite a bit once it hit land, and so uh, that did uh, diminish some of the uh, uh, damage that was done, but it was still very devastating, and many, many people's homes have been uh, damaged, destroyed, and, and again, uh, it's going to be a long time dealing with the, uh, uh, the flooding and uh, the cleanup efforts. So as we go to the Lord today, let's just uh, remember them and... Uh, uh, there's more hurricanes coming. They say this is going to be one of the worst years we, we've had with the numbers and the uh, magnitude of these hurricanes because of the warmer water that they're traveling over. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we come to you tonight, we just want to lift up all of those uh, in the uh, uh, islands throughout the Caribbean and uh, also these uh, states that have been affected in the U.S. Uh, between Texas, Louisiana, Florida, uh, South Carolina, and, and that storm continues to move uh, northward. Lord, other states are going to get a lot of rain, flooding, and Lord, we just want to lift up all of those people in harm's way, that you will protect them, cover them with your blood, Lord. Watch over them. Uh, preserve life, Lord God. Uh, give people wisdom, Lord, to uh, make preparation, to move out of the way if necessary. And uh, we just thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord. Uh, those areas that already have been damaged, Lord, that you will facilitate the cleanup, the recovery, that you will comfort those, Lord, that have lost loved ones and uh, people that lost their homes and belongings. Lord God, that you will just uh, move in your grace and mercy uh, among those people, Lord, to help bring about that uh, restoration and uh, bring things back uh, uh, into to, to some normal, normalcy. And Lord God, as we are gathered here tonight to look into your word, we pray, Lord, that you'll give each one of us that spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better, that you open the eyes of our understanding to know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and your incomparably great power for us who believe. Open up the word to our understanding, Lord. Circumcise our ears to hear and put your salve upon our eyes to see. And let that word become flesh in us, Lord, because we welcome it as is, not the word of men, but the word of God, which works effectively in those who believe. And we declare tonight, Lord, that we do believe in Jesus' name. And so we receive your word, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, tonight... Uh, we're going to be looking into a topic uh, which I've taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we'll look at that uh, scripture verse in just a minute. But I call this uh, wisdom for salvation. And uh, the reason for that is, is because when we look around us, 
uh, you know, just not even looking at, at, at the things going on in this world, but looking at the condition of the church, looking at the condition of professing script, uh, Christians and a lot of these doctrines that are going forth and uh, uh, things that are being preached and taught. We are truly living in dangerous times and uh, uh, we need real wisdom for salvation. And what I mean by that is we have got to get an understanding of what salvation is, of what the redemption of Christ uh, what, uh, came to accomplish uh, in the lives of his people. Uh, because, again, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures here in a minute. Uh, there's a lot of people living in deception today in the church, in the body of Christ, that profess Christ. Uh, but the truth is we are not seeing the fruits of true Christianity being bore, brought forth in their lives. Let me begin in Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, Jude gives us a warning. And again, he is talking about the last days. He's talking about the this time uh, preceding the coming of Christ. And Jude said this, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith to contend earnestly for the faith. That's what we're talking about tonight. We need to contend earnestly for the faith because uh, so many have departed from the faith. So many have uh, shifted from the true foundation of Christianity that is leaving people in a very uh, dangerous condition and position uh, as far as their salvation. So he says, uh, uh, I want to exhort you uh, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the Lord and the, uh, the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude is warning us that the day would come where uh, ungodly men. Now remember, he's talking about he's talking about Christian leaders here, professing Christian leaders. In reality, we're dealing with uh, sheep's in. Uh, 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 wolves in sheep's clothing. That's the, really what we're dealing with here. That's what Jude is talking about. When you read this whole chapter, you'll see that. Uh, these ungodly men have crept in unnoticed. They have gotten into the church and uh, they are doing what? They are turning the grace of God. Another, uh, uh, another version of the Bible says they perverting, they are perverting the grace of God. Now this goes right along with what we talked about uh, not too long ago in our Bible study, dealing with once saved, always saved, or this doctrine of hyper grace. And uh, it goes right along with that. That's exactly what's been happening. Men have crept into the church. These ungodly men that are perverting the, the grace of God. In other words, they are changing uh, the, the definition of what grace really is. And because of that, they are leading people astray. They are deceiving people in the body of Christ, in the church, and uh, leading them astray. And notice what he says, and in doing so, they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's not talking about them outrightly, coming out, uh, just outrightly and uh, say, we don't believe in Jesus. That's, that's not what he's saying here. In fact, let me read Titus chapter 1, verse 16, because he gives us a better understanding of what it means to deny the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what uh, 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 Paul tells us in Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess to know God, and that's exactly what they're doing. They profess to know him, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient and disqualified for every good work. So what Paul is saying is there are people who profess to know Christ, just as Jude uh, was talking about uh, uh, in his book, that do what? They profess to know him, but deny him, okay? Not by what they say, 
but by what they do. Because the reality is, even though they profess to know Christ, uh, the reality is their life does not show the forth the fruits of a true Christian life. They are living in, as Paul says, uh, a disobedience. They're abominable. In other words, that they're 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 hated in the in the eyes of God because of uh, what they're doing, and because of their. Uh, lack of the character of Christ. They're misrepresenting God. Therefore, uh, God says they're an abomination to him and uh, 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 because of the things they are doing. And so that's what we're seeing happening in the church today. This is, this is happening right now in the body of Christ. In fact, if we look at a couple of scriptures, uh, we can see uh, where we are in the timetable of God uh, that lines up with these verses and uh, uh, Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to begin there, Matthew 24, 11. Uh, notice what Jesus tells us concerning uh, the, the time just prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the second time. He says uh, in verse 11, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Now, what did you just say? Certain men have crept in on notice and what they're doing, they are perverting the, the, the grace of God. Uh, they deny, they deny the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ because they have not truly been born again. They are not true uh, disciples of Jesus Christ in holiness, uh, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb with, and, and living out a life of a new creation. These, they're, what he's talking about, these are false prophets that have risen up and are deceiving many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Now, notice what Jesus is saying. Why does lawlessness uh, 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 abound? Because these false prophets are perverting the grace of God and teaching false doctrines, deceiving people into believing that they can live as they please, that they can, uh, uh, as we looked at with that whole doctrine of grace, anything goes uh, because grace covers it all. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. These false prophets are deceiving many, and the result is lawlessness. That means they are without law. They are not abiding uh, by the law of Christ. Now listen, I'm not talking about the Old Testament law where the Bible says we're no longer under the law, I'm talking about the, the rituals of the Old Testament uh, whereby uh, we're saved. We're, we're saved by grace through faith uh, in Jesus Christ. That's not what he's talking about. But there is a law that we are under as Christians. It is the law of Christ. It is the law of love. We are commanded to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. When we fulfill what James calls that royal law of love, we actually end up fulfilling the whole law of God. Amen. But we've got to understand uh, there is a law which we are all under as Christians uh, to obey God. And what uh, Jesus is telling us in these last days before he comes, there's going to be a whole lot of false prophets out here that are perverting the grace of God and deceiving others. And because of it, lawlessness will abound. And when lawlessness abounds, that's that's sin. That is walking uh, uh uh, apart from the headship of Christ, being led by the Holy Spirit. That's what lawlessness is. It is being without law, without the being, being under the subjection, uh, uh, to su subjection to the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit of God and obeying the commandments of Jesus Christ. That's called lawlessness and lawlessness, the Bible tells us, is sin. And what happens is when you are deceived and you begin to live this life of lawlessness, that sin, what does it do? Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 tells us the sin hardens our hearts. And what do we do? We depart from the living God. So when he, when Jesus says, uh, because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold, what's he talking about? We are departing from the living God. 
And uh, that word love in this verse, if you look at the Greek, is the word agape. He's not talking about the lost here. He's talking about professing Christians. He is talking about uh, Christians that are backsliding, that are departing from that relationship from God. They're no longer abiding in that place in Christ. Amen. They have chosen to give themselves over to sin, to lawlessness, and thereby their hearts are being hardened and they are departing from the living God. Amen. And so that's why Jesus says, but he who endures to the end will be saved. In other words, we must continue in the things of God if we're going to uh, uh, persevere to the end and obtain this great salvation. If we go back into sin and we depart from the living God, we are walking on dangerous ground. So Jude is warning us, be careful because there's a whole lot of false prophets that are teaching false doctrine and deceiving many because they're perverting the grace of God. Grace is not licensed to sin. Grace is the power of God to deliver us from sin. Now, Matthew chapter 7 Jesus talks about this same thing, okay? Again, warning us about these last times uh, that we need to re be really careful uh, uh, in these days that we're living in, and we need to discern those people that we listen to, that we're hearing uh, 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 things being preached, and we need to discern, is it truth? Does it line up with the Word of God? Look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, what does Jesus just say? He said the same exact thing he just said in Matthew chapter 24, talking about the last days right before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's happened? A deception is taking place, okay? And lawlessness is abounding because of that. So Jesus is telling us here in Matthew 7, 21, just because you're in the church and you profess Christ doesn't mean you're going to get into the kingdom of God. But who's going to get into the kingdom of God? Who He who does the will of his Father in heaven. Again, that's what I'm talking about. We are under a law. It's the law of Christ. It's the law of love. And uh, we are bound to obey the commandments of Jesus Christ, to do the will of the Father. If we don't, here's what Jesus said. Many will say to me in that day. That's dangerous right there. Many. He's saying there's a whole lot of people that are in the church that are being deceived because of false prophets, false doctrine. Many will say in the that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Again, who's he talking about? He's talking about these false ministers, false brethren, false uh, 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 prophets in the body of Christ. They're the ones doing these things. You can't go by signs. Jesus says you don't know them by their signs. He says you'll know them by their fruits, by their character, by their nature, that they're not lawless, that they're not like Jude says, or, 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 or Paul told us in Titus, they're not abominable and disobedient and unqualified. But rather, they walk in righteousness. They do what is right. They follow. The, the, they're led by the Spirit to walk in righteousness and to show forth the nature and character of God. So here's what Jesus says. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And then Jesus said this, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Now watch this. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There it is again. There it is again. That's the deception that's getting in the body of Christ. People thinking they can live any way they please and do as they please and everything's going to be okay and they're going to the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, oh, wait a minute now. If you're not walking in obedience to me, if you are not subject to me, being led by my spirit in righteousness, you better go back and get things straight because the reality is what you've done is you have allowed sin to harden your heart 
or you never actually came in through the door. You've never been truly redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and been made into a new creation by the supernatural power of God and the blood of Jesus Christ to make you a new creation who lives and walks in righteousness, who has been made holy by the blood of a lamb, been washed from your cleanse, uh, your sins, and have now been made a new creation. And that's what's happening. And notice what he says. Many will be that way. Many in these last days. Uh, uh, lawlessness will abound. Again, talking about many. It will be everywhere. Amen. And again, remember, he's talking about in the church. Not talking about the world. The world is lawless because they don't know Christ. They've never been redeemed by the blood of them. They've been, been changed into new creation. We expect them to be lawless. Amen. They don't follow the laws of God. They don't follow the word of God. They have, they're have they with God. They don't even want to know God. Amen. They, 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 they fall short of the glory of God because of their sin. We expect that from them. Jesus is talking about those in the church, those that profess to know him. That's where it's going on. Why? Because as Jude said, certain men have crept in unawares and have perverted, they have changed the grace of God and they are deceiving multitudes in the body of Christ. Now look at this. Jesus goes on to say this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them... I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Now listen, notice the word he's used there. Therefore, in other words, based on what I just said, that there are many in the body of Christ who say, Lord, Lord, but the reality is they are living a life of lawlessness and they do not, they are not my true children. They have not come into uh, uh, that redemptive work of Christ and, and come into an abiding place in him. He says, uh, so Jesus says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like, uh, I'm sorry, verse uh, verse 25. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So what Jesus is saying is, those who do what? Who obey his commands, who do the word of God, will stand. They will, like we just saw in Matthew 24, they will persevere to the end. Why? Because they're walking in obedience to God. They are fulfilling the commandments of God, doing his will, doing the will of the Father, and being led by the Holy Spirit. But then he turns around and says, but everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Again, what is Jesus saying? He's comparing these two different people in the church. In the church, there is one group that is living in lawlessness, that have been deceived. They are not showing the forth, the fruit, fruits, the true fruits of righteousness in their life, walking in obedience to God, being led by the Spirit. And then on the other hand, you have those that are walking in righteousness, they're obeying God's commands, they're doing the Word of God, and uh, persevering to the end. And we have this mixture. It's like Jesus talks about in another place, the wheat and the tares growing together. The wheat and the tares are growing together in the church. Amen. And so Jesus is warning us, we need to discern these things. We need to recognize what is going on. And again, as he goes, he tells us here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, therefore by their fruits, you will know them by their character by their nature you will know the true people the true saints of god and the false you will recognize them by their fruits do they manifest the fruits of righteousness being led by the spirit of god or are they manifesting the fruits of sin which leads to death okay remember what james says be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. So now you've got a double deception working on, going on. Number one, we've got these false prophets that have crept into the church that are perversing, perverting the grace of God and leading others into deception. But then you got people in the church who are not obeying. They're not doing what the word says. Do they hear the word, but they don't do the word. And they're 
deceiving themselves. And so they're be de being deceived by false prophets, but then they're deceiving themselves because of their disobedience and not doing the things that God has called us to do. And that's what we're seeing all across the body of Christ. When we look at the church today, I'm telling you, we are in this exact place that has been prophesied, that Jesus talks about, that Paul talks about, that almost every writer of the New Testament talks about in the last days. Jude talks about, Peter talks about it, that this, this deception has gotten into the church, gotten into the body of Christ, and it all has to do with this perversion of the grace of God that we are not understanding this great salvation that Jesus brought to change us into a new creation whereby we walk in righteousness and obedience unto God. Amen. Now, I say that to say this. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, here's what Paul told Timothy. He says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. Now, we just did a whole uh, uh, sermon on that just a, a couple months ago, uh, continuing in the things of God. Uh, that, that's, that, that's the whole concept, the whole idea. When we talk about once saved, always saved. You will only remain saved as you continue in the things of God, as you abide in Christ. You remain in Him as He remains in you. You don't get into sin and lawlessness and harden your heart whereby you depart from God. You abide in that place of intimacy with Him. Amen. So Paul is warning Timothy, saying, I'm telling him the same thing. You must, you must continue in the things of God. Now here's what he said. Knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, that's what this series is about that I'm starting today, and uh, over the next uh, few Bible studies, we're going to look at this, because this right here, what Paul is telling Timothy, is crucial to what's going on in the body of Christ today, and it is crucial to understanding what Jesus came to do, and uh, if we don't get this, if we don't understand this, we uh, are going to have a lot of people being led astray, and on that day that Jesus comes, there's going to be a whole lot of people say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's going to be a sad day for a lot of people. Multitudes are on that wide road of destruction thinking, being deceived that they are going to into the kingdom of God. And the reality is they are not going to get in the kingdom of God because as Jesus told us, uh, their lawlessness has led them astray. Now, I want you to notice here what Paul told Timothy, that uh, he needed to have uh, a, a, a wisdom for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And where does that wisdom come from? The Holy Scriptures. Now, listen, when Paul wrote this, there was no New Testament, okay? They didn't have the New Testament. The Holy Scriptures that he's talking about, that Timothy learned from a child, from his grandmother and from his mother. He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Covenant, okay? That's what he's talking about. That's what they preached. That's what Jesus preached. That's what Paul preached in the beginning. They preached the Old Testament, especially to the Jews, to get them to understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham. Jesus was the fulfillment as revealed in the prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament. So Paul is telling Timothy, if you want to understand this salvation, if you want wisdom for this salvation that comes through faith in Christ Jesus, you must understand the Holy Scriptures as revealed in the Old Testament. That's why in Luke uh, uh, chapter 24, uh, one of the last things that Jesus did when he, uh, be right before he ascended into heaven and, uh, and, uh, 
departed from the saints. Remember, he had he, he he went up on the mountain and he had all the disciples and uh, multitudes came. And Jesus gave them the last commission. He told them what, what they were to do. He told them to go wait in Jerusalem to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, to receive power from on high, the promise of the Father. But here's what Jesus did just before he ascended. And, and listen, to, listen to what Jesus said. In Luke 24, verse 45, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. What Scriptures? The Old Testament. They needed to understand the prophetic Scriptures of the Old Testament. They needed to understand the revelation of Christ in the Old Covenant so that they could preach this gospel properly now under the new covenant so that they could make those people understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of everything that God promised. Amen. And I'm telling you, there are too many in ministry today, too many uh, preachers and ministers out there that they ignore the Old Testament scriptures. They are not uh, uh, getting an understanding from the Old Testament scriptures. And so they are giving out an incomplete or sometimes erroneous or sometimes even false gospel in the New Testament because they don't understand what Jesus came to do in reality what Jesus came to fulfill in reality, and so they are deceiving people or giving them half-truths which are not able to bring them into the full redemptive work of Christ. Now, the first thing I want to cover tonight dealing with this is, number one, the whole Old Testament is considered a covenant between Israel and God, or we could say between God and His people, because ultimately that covenant uh, with God uh, carries over to his people uh, even today as far as the church is concerned. Let me explain that to you in just a minute, okay? But first of all, we have to understand that God's relationship with Israel was based on covenant. And this is extremely important because it's something that we have lost sight of in today's church. You don't even hear people talking about this or preaching about this much in today's church. Most Christians don't understand that the relationship with God is based on covenant. Okay, now, what is a covenant? Well, if you are going to the dictionary and look up the word covenant, this is what it tell you. It is a formal, solemn and binding agreement or a compact. Okay, It is a written agreement or promise usually under seal between two or more parties, especially for the performance of some action. So when we look at the Old Testament and we look at the covenant between God and Israel, we can see that everything I just read is absolute truth. God entered into this binding formal agreement with Israel that he would be their God and they would be his people. Okay, They uh, uh, had uh, or entered into this uh, uh, agreement, this promise between two parties and it was sealed by the blood. Okay, That old covenant, everything to do with that old covenant had to be sprinkled with the blood of animals. That's what sealed the covenant between God and and his people. Everything to do with that covenant was sprinkled with blood. The, 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 the priests were sprinkled. The people were sprinkled. The book of the covenant, the, the law, the, the tabernacle, the ark of the covenant, everything to do it was sealed. It was sprinkled with the blood of animals. Okay, That was how they made covenant. Now, that idea of covenant has to do with, it comes from a Latin term, which means a coming together. And it presupposes that two or more parties who come together, that they are coming together to make a contract, agreeing on promises, stipulations, privileges, and responsibilities. Okay? And that's exactly what we see with this covenant between God. Okay? It is two parties. God is one party. 
and his people is the other party, in this case, Israel. Okay? They enter into this agreement between each other, and they uh, are making a contract with one another. They are agreeing on these promises and these stipulations and these privileges and these responsibilities. Okay? Now, it's important to understand this. I'm going to show you a minute. But let me just read to you Malachi chapter 2, verse 5. And I'm going to read this out of the uh, Amplified Bible because it brings it out more clearly. But this right here, this verse in Malachi chapter 2, verse 5, gives us a very simplified form of God's covenant between him and his people. And as you're going to discover, it is the same exact covenant that he has made between him and his church. It's never changed. The covenant itself has not changed. The essence of the covenant has not changed. Okay? And I'll show you this as we look into the scriptures. But here's what, here's what Malachi chapter 2 verse 5 says. He says, My covenant on my part with Levi, talking about the uh, representatives of Israel, the priests, okay, was to give him life and peace. So God is saying, I'm making a covenant with Israel, and here's my covenant. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give them life and peace. That's God's promise. Now, that word life there means all of the blessings of God. Everything that God has come in the way of blessing, protection, healing, deliverance, provision, all of the blessings, all of the promises of God that He gives them in the Old Testament are included in that word life and peace. It was all about God giving them life and peace peace, that they could rest in God. They could be at peace with God. He would protect them from their enemies. He would keep them from harm's way. He would provide for everything for them. In other words, they can rest in this relationship with God, and God would provide every single thing that they needed for life, and that life more abundantly. And listen, that gets even greater in the New Testament under Jesus. But listen, that's the covenant that God promised to give Israel. But a covenant, again, it has to do with two parties. It's an agreement between two people. That's God's promise. That's God's, uh, 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 what he tells us here, stipulation. That's what God's giving them, the privileges and uh, God's responsibilities. Now, this is what I'm going to be responsible for. I'm going to give you life and peace. But let's go on in Malachi 2, 5. So he says to Levi, I'm going to give you life and peace because on his part, on, on the part of the people, on the part of the priest, he says, of the reverent and worshipful fear with which the priest would revere me and stand in awe of my name. Now, let's simplify it. Here's God's covenant with Israel. I give you life and peace, you fear me. I give you life and peace, and you fear me. You reverence me. You stand in awe of me. Now, what does that mean? That means that we obey him, that we recognize him for who he is. He is God. He is our creator. He is our Lord. He is, uh, he is, he has everything. He has the preeminence. That means that we come into this relationship and to fear him means we put ourselves into subjection to him. Okay? Now, it's important to understand this. And you can go back to my last uh, sermon, uh, Bible study I did uh, uh, last month on the fear of the Lord. Go back and listen to that on YouTube or Facebook because that's what we're talking about here when we talk about this fear of God. We have got to understand this because it's something that we're missing in under in the church today when it comes to people getting saved and again without this there is no true repentance and therefore there is no true salvation apart from that but listen we've got to understand that this covenant relationship between us and god has to do with god giving us life and peace but we fear him we obey him and what that has to do with again when a person comes to god we have got to change Listen, a lot of stuff that people are preaching to lead people to the Lord is erroneous, okay? You know, we hear some of these things, oh, just, just believe that God loves you. Just ask Him to come into your heart. You know, just, no, that's not what the Bible's talking about. 
we are entering into a covenant relationship with God. This is something serious. And on our part, in order to enter into that covenant relationship, it requires a complete surrender. What did Jesus say? We can't come unto him except what? Except we give up our life. We have to lay down our life to have his life. We must surrender ourselves wholly and completely to him in order to enter into this covenant relationship. It is a surrender of life. And when you read through the New Testament, you're going to find when they deal with salvation, when they talk about uh, people coming to the Lord, that's what they're talking about. It is not some, you know, half-hearted, uh, oh yeah, I just want you, I want the blessings of God. You know, I know God loves me. Oh Jesus, come fill up my heart with no true surrender, with, which is really a part of uh, what uh, a re true repentance really is. You can't, you can't get saved that way. There has to be this surrender whereby we enter into this covenant that we are going to fear God. We are going to walk in reverence, in respect of who He is. We are going to live like He is God. He is Lord. He is the, 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 the Master. He is the one. That's why He tells us what? What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 6? What did he say? We're not our own. We are bought with a price. We don't have the right to do as we please. We don't have the right to just go out and do whatever we want. We are not our own. We have been bought with right. We belong to God, and therefore we must live as the servants of God. We must live in that right relationship under the fear of God and respect and reverence of His, uh, uh, of His Lordship over our life. In other words, like Paul says, we're not our own. We do what? We glorify Him in our body and spirit. In other words, we live for God. Our whole life is about uh, living under the leadership of the Holy Spirit in obedience to God. Now, I can see that I'm not having a lot of time here, so I'm just going to give you uh, 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 one scripture uh, just to, to give you an understanding of what it means to fear God. Okay, But first, le first let me give you Romans chapter 8. Verse 5 and 6. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. Because notice what, what uh, 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 Malachi just says. My covenant is to give you life and peace, okay? And you fear me or you obey me. You recognize my Godship, my Lordship over your life. Now look what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, because this I'm trying to I'm trying to get you to see this. It's the same covenant that God made with Israel. He's also made with the church. And we need to walk in this thing. Okay? Look what he says. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. In other words, if you're living in a disobedience, if you're not walking after the in obedience to God uh, uh, by way of the Holy Spirit, then you have set your mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So Paul is saying there's two types of people. Either you're living out to the flesh, living for yourself, living this life of lawlessness that we've been looking at, living this life of you dictating, you being the Lord, you being the God, you making the decisions, or you're in the other camp and you are of the Spirit and you are uh, living according to the Spirit and living after the things of the Spirit. That's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 7.21. That's exactly what he's talking about in Matthew 7, 24. Either you are walking in the Spirit, in obedience to God, or you're walking in the flesh, oh my goodness, in obedience to sin. Okay? And that's why Jesus says, you are workers of lawlessness, and I don't know you when that day comes. Okay? Now, look what, look what Paul says. For to be carnally minded is death. If you are the one that is God of your life, that Jesus is not truly your Lord, if you are not walking in the fear of God, in obedience to Him, okay, you're walking after the lust of your flesh. He says to be carnally minded is death. He's talking about spiritual death. You will die. You will not enter the kingdom of God. But look what he says. But to be spiritually minded, to be walking in the things of the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit is what? Life and death. Peace. There it is. 
That's God's covenant. When we are walking in obedience to God, fearing God, what, 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 what do we get in return? Life and peace. We get life and peace. That's God's covenant. He comes to give us life and peace. And again, that word life includes all the blessings of God, everything that God has, healing, deliverance, provision, protection, you name it, his angels, his gifts, his fruit, every blessing that God has is included in his life and peace. Amen. And how does it come about? By entering into this covenant with God, whereby we fear him and we obey him. So let me close with this one more verse, okay, to explain to you what does it mean when he says, uh, I give you life and peace, but on your part, you must fear me. You must reverence me. You must obey me, okay? Here's what it means. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. Here it is. Listen to what the Bible says. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Or you can say, but now church, but now, people of God, what does the Lord your God require of you? Remember, God has never changed. And I'm telling you what, when you get an understanding of this, when you see what he's talking about, this covenant hasn't changed either. The, 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 what, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, uh, makeup of this covenant, what it, the promise is, the simplicity of promise, God gives us life and peace and we fear him, okay, has never changed. Okay, and I'll explain that to you in the next one when I have some time to show you these scriptures. Okay, but listen to what he says. What does the Lord God require of you? In other words, by entering into this covenant, what does God require for you to do? He's given us life and peace. What does he require us to do? Well, look what Deuteronomy says. What does the Lord require of you? But to fear the Lord your God. There it is again. The same thing Malachi said. I'm going to give you life and peace, but you have to fear the Lord your God. Now, he then breaks it out. What does it mean to fear the Lord your God? And look what Deuteronomy says. To walk in all his ways. To walk in all his ways. What's that mean? Being led by the Holy Spirit in righteousness as a new creation. And to love him. Isn't that what the whole New Testament is about? The whole, the whole gospel of Christ. Isn't that what it's about? To love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Okay, but he doesn't stop there. Look what he says. When you fear God, this is what you do. You, you walk in all of his ways. You love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Why? Because we've been bought with a price. We're not our own. We were created. We were saved in order to glorify him in our body and spirit. Amen. That means you serve him with all of your being. Now you start thinking about what I'm telling you here. Okay. And to keep the commandments of the Lord. Isn't that what Jesus says? If you're mine, if you love me, you will do what? Obey my commandments. And if you don't really love me, you won't obey my commandments. Isn't that what Jesus said? Absolutely. Isn't that what he said? The greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself. Isn't that what Jesus said? Okay. And his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Why is it for our good? Because when we fear God by walking in all of his ways, by loving him, serving him with all our hearts and strength, obeying his commandments and keeping his judgments, and statutes, guess what? God gives us life and peace. As we keep covenant relationship with God, we receive the benefits. We re receive the promises, the privileges of God, of life and peace and everything that entails. Amen. Can you begin to see here, when we look at today's church, if, if this is what it means to fear God, go back and listen to that sermon I did on the fear of the Lord. There is no fear of God in today's church. Why? How do we know? Because number one, they don't obey Him. They're living in sin. Multitudes in the body of Christ today are living in known habitual sin. We, we reject the Word of God, the truth of God, and we're not loving Him with all our hurts and strength. We're living in idolatry. Much of the church is living in idolatry. We love sin more than God. We entertain ourselves with sin. And on top of that, how many are serving him with all our heart, soul, and strength? Going out and making disciples. Doing exactly what Jesus said. Go therefore and make disciples. Obey my command. Do what I say do. How many in the church today are doing that? Well, what's the problem? They don't fear God. 
And why? Because they have either broken covenant or they've never entered into true covenant relationship with God. Oh, God help us. I'm running out of time. I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, I, 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 next time, uh, the uh, next Bible study, you won't want to miss it. Again, they'll be on uh, uh, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, this Today's uh, Bible study will be on both uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, actually, it'll be go straight on to Facebook because I just posted it, but then I got to, I got to tra- uh, change it and bring it over onto, onto YouTube. That'll take a couple of days, and I'll get them on there so that you can see those. Uh, but this is so key, so important for the church today. Because I'm telling you, just as Jesus warned us, just as almost every single writer in the New Testament warned us, in the last days there will be many, many false prophets, false teachers, uh, false brethren, bringing doctrines of demons, perverting the grace of God, changing the law of God and the ways of God, and causing people to depart from the true faith. They are destroying the foundations of righteousness and justice. They are uh, deceiving people left and right with these doctrines and leading people into lawlessness. And it is dangerous times we are living in. There are many, 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 many warnings throughout the New Testament warning about these things that would happen. We're seeing it right now before our eyes. But Paul is telling us the answer is we must go back into the Old Testament. We must get a revelation, an understanding of what Jesus came to do as prophesied, as revealed in this Old Covenant on the prophetic scriptures that were revealing Christ in the Old Testament. And he will show us exactly what Jesus came to do. And again, when you understand that, And then you look to see, is that the fruit we are bearing? Is that the gospel that we are preaching? You're going to find out we need to make some adjustments and we need to get the true gospel out so that we don't facilitate souls going into hell and waking up one day and Jesus say, I don't know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. But rather, we will be presenting to God an offering of souls that is acceptable in his sight that has been approved by him because they have received the full redemptive work of Christ in their life. So again, I'm going to get this. Uh, uh, we'll continue with this. My next Bible study, uh, I will make uh, uh, notify you on uh, Facebook uh, for the next one. I also send out emails. If you're not on my email list, just go to my website, powerfortodaypropheticministries.org, and you can sign up uh, for my email list, or you can just uh, 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 send me a message on Facebook, and I will uh, just give me your uh, email address, and I'll get you on my email list so that you can keep up with the things uh, that are going forth and hear the truth of God's word, scripture upon scripture, line upon line, so that you won't be found wanting in that day. You won't come up short having believed a lie, having having rejected the truth and believed a lie, and end up in a place you don't want to be. Amen. Amen. So again, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that you break open the bread of your word and give us understanding that the word will bear fruit in the here in the heart of everyone listening to this message. That Lord, they will hear with spiritual ears. They will recognize the truth of your word and embrace it. That that word become flesh in them and produce your kingdom in them. In Jesus' name, Father, we just continue to pray for all of those who've been affected by these storms that you will cover them with your blood, protect them, and keep them. Lord, supernaturally provide, uh, make provision for every need of these people that are in places maybe they can't get to a store, maybe they can't get some of the things they need, that you would supernaturally provide for them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you're listening to this, I want to release right now miracles, signs, and wonders. If you need to be healed in Jesus' name, be healed by his stripes. You are made whole. I invoke the name of Jesus. I invoke the name of Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you right now. Receive your healing right now in Jesus' name. Be free in Jesus' name. I release creative miracles right now. Organs be recreated. Limbs be recreated in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray the blessings of God upon you. This is George Dello. Power for Today Prophetic Ministries coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. Be, just join with me again on our next Bible study, and we're going to really get into the Word of God and show you the truth that will set you free in Jesus' name. And let me encourage you, keep looking up because your redemption draws nigh 
Amen. Amen. God bless you.